Policy Organization and Leadership in the College of Education at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign and a Director of Common Ground Research Networks, a non-for-profit organization hosting and organizing this conference. Okay? And, uh, well, located in the university, in this university's research park. His research interests over the, uh, in, the, in, in the past and now as well include theories and practices of pedagogy, cultural and linguistic diversity, and new technologies of representation and communication. His recent research has focused on the development of digital writing and assessment technologies with the support of a lot of major grants from the U.S. Department of Education, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, the results have been the Common Ground Scholar, a very interesting social knowledge, knowledge platform, um, multimodal one. With Mary Clancy's, he has co-authored a number of uh, publications such as New Learning, Elements of the Science of Education in Cambridge University Press. Uh, it has now the third edition to 2021. Literacist, also Cambridge University Press with a second edition in 2016. E-Learning Ecologies, 2000. And 17, and a two volume grammar of multimodal meaning, making sense and adding sense, uh, published by Cambridge University Press in 2020. Uh, so, uh, we're going to listen to this interesting talk. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. <clears throat> Thank you very much, um, Rafael. So, just a, a little introduction to this, that this generative AI stuff has, has turned up recently and it's created an enormous fuss. And I'm not normally a technological enthusiast, but gradually it's crept up on, and you know, like I've worked in e-learning, I've worked in applied linguistics, I've worked in these areas uh, for a while, and gradually the significance of it has crept up on me. And recently I've sort of come to the conclusion that this is another one of these great modern inventions and as problematic as all these inventions are. So, um, you know, the other great moment in the technologies of text, that's what, essentially what this is, the technology of text. One great moment, of course, was the, the removable type, the, the Gutenberg Press of 1450. Um, there was a precursor for this, of course, in China, so it depends what your enthusiasms are. Bing Shen invented something in 1052 which was movable type as well but it didn't take off in China the way it, the Gutenberg Press took uh, um, uh, off. But in a way a lot of what was done with that text, uh, with that machine was was problematic. The texts weren't, you know, some of them were liber liberatory, some were not. Um, complicated. Um, and we're in a similar moment with this. This is the first machine that can write, right? This is a machine that can write and write coherent text. Um, so it's a very big moment, and as educators and people interested in technology and society, uh, we need to be thinking about it a lot. So in this talk, I'm going to go through three points. So they're three quite different points, and it's quite a, there's quite a lot of stuff to cover, so you'll have to be patient with me. So the first thing is platform pedagogies. Pla by platform, we mean um, uh, interacting uh, in learning environments through some sort of a digital platform. Um, and what generative AI does in this platform. So that's a general introduction about the idea of platform-based computer-mediated learning. Um, the second thing is I'm going to show you what we've been doing with our students, and I'm going to show you a release that we made within the CG Scholar environment on the 7th of February. I'm going to show you students' work in the last couple of weeks. Um, and we've been just surprised, to be quite frank, and I'm going to show you a surprise, an example of some student work and the way in which we've been using generative AI to support that work. So that's getting quite practical and, and showing you an example of students at work. Then the third point I'm going to get to is um, I'm going to say artificial intelligence is a terrible idea. So you're going to have to wait for that and that's a big picture view of, um, of, of, of theoretically what we're dealing with. Apropos of Phil's talk yesterday, I want to talk theoretically about what underlies all this stuff and why I think we should question this notion of artificial intelligence. 
So that's the structure of the talk. So let's get into the first part. And this is this idea of platform pedagogies um, and the idea that learning can be computer mediated. And this is by no means a new idea. Um, B.F. Skinner, back in uh, 54, I think it was, patented this um, teaching machine. Now, this was an electronic machine. It was a purely mechanical machine. But if you read um, down the bottom there, it might as well be instructions for a learning management system, or it might as well be, um, you know, kind of a piece of e-learning software that's being um, spoken about. Um, and look, the ideas that I'm talking about here cover three or four papers that Mary and I have written in the last couple of years. Um, this is one here talking about this general idea of platform learning. But later on, I'm going to give you a QR code where you can get them all. So don't worry about the, the references particularly. Now, this is um, the world's first computer-mediated e-learning system. So this is Plato. Um, it doesn't really, it might stand for something, it may not. It's not the philosopher, it's programmed learning for something. It doesn't matter, one of these computer acronyms. Um, and this is, a, by the way, Ted Nelson's view of it, the, the great kind of libertarian computer person, Ted Nelson. This is his view of what Plato meant. And this is an example of a Plato screen built in the 70s and the 80s. But what's really interesting is that they started building Plato in 1959. So University of Illinois is part of the great uh, American industrial military complex. Um, the story is that... Um, a quick version of the story is that uh, von Neumann built this idea of a computer based on the model of a mind um, in, at, at um, Princeton, where, where um, Einstein was as well, at the uh, you know, Advanced Research Center at Princeton. Um, and it never worked. Then the, on the same principles, um, the University of Illinois got a contract to build a computer for the army. And the deal was that they would build two of these things. The army would take one, and the Il Illinois would keep the other one. So it was a computer called Iliac, and it made the von Neumann principles work for the first time. They didn't work in the first versions, but at last this was a machine that worked. But right from the very beginning on this Iliac mainframe, they, um, there was a, a key person there who thought, look, we could use this for education. And the first e-learning system was this Plato environment, which from 1959 was in use at the University of Illinois and then became used, you know, was used at other places. And the interesting thing, and Mary and I tell this story in this particular paper here, we did a history of this, is that everything which is problematic and interesting and revolutionary and disastrous about e-learning, they discovered right at the start. So it was possible for students to talk to each other via the computer, but even more revolutionary, what it needed, it needed a visual interface. Computers never had visual interfaces before. And the people building Plato built the world's first flat plasma screen. This is it. And it was a touch screen. So, but, uh, and it was multimodal in the sense that you could put images up there. There's an image, you see. Um, you could put images and text there. It was the first time a computer had carried language, actually, rather than just being a calculation, ca calculating machine. So the very interesting um, aspect of this was these foundational things about modern computing were incidental to the construction of an educational application on the back of a big computer that was essentially meant for the army. So it's, it's a, a very interesting story. And um, the first kind of chat, there was a thing called Talkomatic where students could talk to each other. The very first emojis were created here. The very first games were created here. And this was also the very first synthesized music as well. So it's a kind of, you know, I'm a historian by training, so I'm always interested in the historical context of these things. So moving on now, fast forward. Um, we've moved through to generative AI. Oh, and one more thing I want to say before I get onto this is that this was actually the the model of cloud computing. Personal computing was a bit of a diversion where you took the computer off and took it home and it wasn't connected to anything because these were just terminals all on the mainframe, right? So the, the interactivity was possible around the platform, right? It wasn't the, it wasn't the terminal, it was the platform that created the possibility of interact, interactivity. So in a sense, it was everything that cloud computing is today as well. Now, Moving forward to generative AI, which is just another one of these cloud applications um, where there's a big mainframe somewhere that's got the language model in the darn thing and we're talking to it through our phones and, and whatever. A definition up at the, the top there is that it can be, it, it's uniquely reconstituted text, image, sound, or multimodal combinations of these. 
But the, the really important thing is this is the first time a machine has been able to write. These are essentially writing machines, and I'll talk about what I mean by that in a moment, um, to produce coherent meaning, which is not, it, it's resynthesized human meaning, um, which is, a, it's a big change. And what's underneath it, and for us as educators, um, it's, it's not working well. Okay, we'll keep going. All right. Um, the, these machines are learning machines, and inside it are these three forms of machining, su machine learning, supervised machine learning, unsupervised, and what's called reinforcement machine learning. So let me tell you, and the interesting thing is it's a return to B.F. Skinner, and it's a return to behaviorism. So we always thought behaviorism was mechanistic and not suitable for human beings. It's probably not. It's really suitable for computers, and at last it's come, come into its own. So um, how that works is, um, how the reinforcement learning works is, you know, the, the uh, I'm going to come to this sentence in a moment, um, I walked the dog, right? So I walked, and the machine has to guess the next word based on the context, right? So what it does, it trains itself by trying to guess the next word and then validate the response, reinforcement, positive or negative. And it goes through millions of words and builds what's called vectors, the relationship between words, using Skinnerian, Skinnerian principles. Um, and in fact, to do that with the, um, uh, the big models now, um, to go through and to build each model, um, costs $100 million worth of computing time to do that because it's comparing every word to every word via these huge number of small reinforcement learning cycles. So, to talk about generative AI then, um, there are two fundamental technologies here, which are kind of different from each other, to be quite frank. So, um, generative AI is the um, umbrella term. There's two sides. There's a chatbot side, which is dialogue, and then there's the large language model, which is this kind of resource about the nature of words. Talk about the history of each of these, and neither of these are new. So, this is Joseph um, Weizenbaum, 1966. This is the world's first chatbot. And what's kind of really interesting about this is that he decided he would use Rogerian um, psychoanalysis um, as the basis for the dialogue. And the psychological games played in Rogerian analysis become the, the psychological kind of <laughs> anthropomorphic things that we now do in chatbots. Um, and so this is it here. And so Eliza was the machine that was the analyst. And what the machine did, which was kind of really clever, was not give answers, but just ask questions. And often the other person would have their, um, uh, answer their own questions along the way. And one kind of salutary um, aspect of this is that um, he gave his, uh, a female secretary this job um, to test it out, just to try it out. Um, and at a certain point, um, all these questions came up and the machine kept on responding and whatever, and she asked him to leave the room because it had become like a human being and she didn't want him to hear what she was saying to the machine. So, um, uh, and then what he did, by the way, it's, it's a very interesting story, is he then became, he wrote a big book in 76, which was a diatribe against technology, essentially. He was freaked out by what this chatbot did. But anyhow, my main point is it's not, the idea of talking to a machine, a dialogue backwards and forwards, is not at all new. Generative AI kind of mechanizes this in a much more sophisticated way because this was a set of pre-programmed responses. If the, if the person says this, respond like this. If the person responds, respond like this, and so on. That's how it worked. Now, so that's one component of the technology. The second component of the technology is um, large language models. And I got this GIF off of an article about this man. You know this man? If you don't know this man, this man's unbelievably important. So this man's name's Robert Mercer, and he got his PhD at the University of Illinois. So much of what's wrong with the modern world and good about the modern world, you can blame the University of Illinois for it. 1972, he got his PhD. He went to work, after getting the PhD, he went to work at IBM, and ended up working in the area of machine translation. And they had a kind of a big insight uh, sometime in the late 70s, which is, you know, pre-programming language logic into a machine uh, was incredibly complex. The more you thought about the intricacies of human meaning, the, the structures of meaning become more and more, it's a receding horizon. So they gave up on that and they c came up with 
a process that they call statistical language analysis, which is just, let's just look at the statistical relationship of one word uh, and another. And there's a very famous quote when he got a Lifetime Achievement Award from the uh, a Computational Linguistics Society in the US. Um, he said, look, what my boss told me was, every time we fire a linguist, the system gets better. It's a famous quote, um, which is, don't try and think about the structure of language, just think about the statistical relationship of words with each other. Now, the, the reason why he's an important person is um, he then uh, made a fortune in a, a, a set of hedge funds um, using these technologies and, you know, to play information around the prospects of businesses and whatever, uh, and then became a founder of Cambridge Analytica. Uh, you, you, can I fill in the rest of the story for you? Um, uh, so, and then he was a big, firstly, he supported Ted Cruz. When Ted Cruz dropped out, he supported Trump. So using these technologies, by the time the, the um, uh, 2016 election turned up in the US, they were using Facebook profiles to put out 60,000 different advertisements a day. Right, not 60,000 60, different messages. So if you were in a particular Haitian community in Miami, um, uh, in some little quarter of Miami, there were messages about how the Clinton Foundation had made a mess of the situation after the Haitian uh, earthquake. Now, I didn't need that message in Illinois, but that particular community in, uh, in, um, in Miami did need it. So um, he put this to good work, um, this technology. Good work, it, it was effective. But part of my point here is these are not new underlying technologies. You know, the underlying principles have been thought through many, many decades ago. Now, fast forward now, we have uh, this combination of technologies, chat plus LLM, um, and uh, we have GPT-4. And it's a problem for education because the reason why everything a student can do to demonstrate their performance in learning, the machine can do for them. Um, and um, a, a, an English academic who works in the e-learning area had a nice phrase for it, it's democratised cheating. So um, uh, before it cost a bit of money to cheat, which is you had to pay somebody 100 bucks in India to write your essay for you uh, online, which you could do, um, which were these well, called essay mills. Um, and he estimated that 10 to 15 percent of submissions in American universities were created in essay mills, but you had to have the money to pay for them. Well, this is democratised cheating, and one of the things is that all the plagiarism detectors turn it in and whatever, they just don't work, and they can't work, and they, they, and they will never work. It's never possible to know whether, because every text is perfectly formed and absolutely unique in every rendering, there's no way of ever knowing uh, whether it was created by a GPT or not. The only sign really, by the way, is if it's got no typos in it. You know, I'm a reasonably good writer, and I can't write without typos. Um, and these have no typos. So the answer is, put a few typos in, and you'll be fine. <laughs> now, by the way, I've got a solution to this, a definitive solution. Here it is. <laughs> so if we regard, and by the way, in this is an implicit understanding of the nature of learning and the nature of education, which is education is individualised long-term memory. It's the stuff you can remember without any social support. What kind of knowledge do we have these days which doesn't have social supports? I mean, I sit at a dinner table and I look up something on Wikipedia and, you know, I mean, I, I, what I can remember is irrelevant and also diminishing. You know, I used to be able to remember a lot of people's phone numbers, um, uh, but I don't now. You know, I can't remember even close family members' numbers um, because I don't need to. I've got these things that I would call cognitive prostheses, which are becoming more important to us in our lives all the time. So this is a, a, a kind of a, um, a definition of learning. By the way, the definition of, long -term, uh, of um, learning here is long-term long memory. And Long term, of course, you know, you die eventually, what's long? Um, long term is until the day after the exam, right? So that's, um, uh, so do we, you know, is, this is now a kind of entirely anachronistic view of learning, but also, realistically, if these machines are there to help us as cognitive processes, how do we use them? What do we do with them? Now, what I want to show you now is what's deeply wrong with the GPT environment, and I'm going to give you an example. So one of my um, unhealthy interests, that something I know more about than anybody else in the world, and I shouldn't perhaps, but I do, is the Peloponnesian Railway. So the Peloponnesian Railway, um, there it is, it's a ruin. It was abandoned some years ago. There's the bridge over the Corinth Canal. There's a bit of an old bridge there that's been um, uh, a ruin, and there's some old trains that have been left behind. So what I do is I say to the GPTs, this is my standard 
question because I know what the answer is. Um, and I, I, I say to them, uh, write me an essay on the history of the Peloponnesian Railway with references. Here it is. Look, it looks really good. The Peloponnesian Railway is a road system. In 1869, the Greek government signed a contract. Construction began in 1881 and then paid two. This is pretty amazing, but it does it in 15 seconds or something. Okay, so what's wrong with it? Well, firstly, it's very much like an essay, you know, however, and, you know, it's got this kind of stilted essay form. A cute thing to do, by the way, is ask the GPT to write a love letter for you. And the last paragraph is always in conclusion. Um, <laughs> which, um, so anyhow, this is, um, um, this is kind of, it's got this stilted essay form. doesn't matter. Um, this would do pretty well when I was, if I was assigned that uh, essay as a student. But first thing is, decommissioned in the 1970s, actually it was closed in 2011. So that's so, uh, you know, dramatically wrong that it doesn't, it's definitively de decommissioned in the 1970s, but it's actually definitively wrong. They call this hallucination. Um, the word I prefer to use, uh, there's a very important um, uh, Princeton University philosopher whose the na name is Harry Frankfurt. Do you know the book? Uh, and it's called bullshitting. So um, this is another way of just bullshitting. It just, you know, it looks good, but it's actually just inventing stuff. And the other thing is the references down the bottom here, uh, they don't exist. They look pretty damn good. Look, there's a, you know, publication, publishing organization, they'll give you URLs, and they're all rubbish. They're all just invented. Now, the interesting thing, by the way, is I keep giving this essay to new GPTs as they arrive, as they arise. So this is actually was done on 3.5. In 4, what they do is they just give vague things about the references. Go and look up history society. You know, they've, be, they've been sort of fine-tuned, which means the LLM's been overwritten, um, not to give less um, wrong information, but when it doesn't have the right information, it just says go somewhere else. So that's how GPT's responded to it. Gemini's response is really interesting, to be quite frank. So Gemini, I always predicted that Google would come out with a much better one pretty quickly because they've got all this scanned source material they've stolen from libraries and other places. Um, and what, what, um, what Gemini does, it puts the false references in, and then because Google dominates search, it goes and searches for those and deletes them because they're wrong and finds real references, um, which is kind of interesting. So, but it's not intrinsic to the LLM to allow that to happen. And Google does that only. So look, um, I'm going to say, look, there are things deeply, deeply wrong with this whole technology. And there's, look, it's a clever technology, but because it's mashing up words and just coming out with coherent stuff. Um, um, so sourcing, we've seen that. Facts, we've seen that. It's wrong. Um, theory, it doesn't have a sense of what history might be as a discipline. Um, and if it's well-mannered, um, it's not because the sources are that. So for example, if I say, look, give, look I'm feeling really depressed. Give me a, a quick formula for suicide. It's all there in the LLM. I'd like to be a kind of a, a, a terrorist with a dirty bomb. How would I do that? It's all there. But it, what happens is manually it's overridden um, and it, it's polite about the world um, and it gives kind of information to you which has been heavily overwritten by human, uh, human filterers. The last thing is critical dialogue. A la Eliza, it wants to drag you in by being nice to you. And so it's often not that useful for and it's been tuned to be like that. You know, it's not naturally like that. Um, so um, uh, it, it, it's overly friendly when in an education environment you want something that's a bit more critical a lot of the time. Now, um, what's the underlying technology uh, here? Um, so firstly, um, it's a text technology. So what's text? This is all it does, by the way. Um, that which can be expressed in Unicode. So behind everything on our phones, uh, Unicode characters, um, and that includes math and code. So everything's on the same field if it can be expressed in Unicode. And down here on the right, I say, look, there are 149,000 characters in Unicode. It consists of, of you know, every language in the world and a whole lot of abstract symbologies, including emojis. Um, now, it works around semantics, and the basic unit is a, a, um, is a token. So the word, you know, I walked the dog. I'm going to talk about that a bit more in a second. Walk is the unit. ED is a separate token because, you know, walk um, is doing something. ED is the past tense. So what it does, it, it's roughly equivalent to a word, but in fact they're kind of semantic units. And it's, but it's, and it's multimodal too, 
but only mediated by text. So the only reason why it can do images is because the text, the images have been labelled. You know, this is the, the Alps with the sky and the snow. Um, uh, and then it can only pull those images out with a written prompt. Give me an image of whatever. So in other words, it's primarily a text technology. Um, now, I want to show you how it works. And this is a kind of a, um, this walked word um, here. Um, um, I walk to work. Okay. Um, and I got Leonardo to generate these images for me. Um, so that's how I like to think I walk to work. Um, it's, it's how Leonardo likes to think how I might walk to work. Um, and so there, our token is walked, right? Now, what I want to explain to you is the way in which um, latent semantics, now look, there is no semantics in the system. It's only latent around the statistics the system uses, right? And how it ends up being roughly semantic. Now, I walk the dog. I happen to have <laughs> a standard poodle, and our standard poodle looks nothing like that. Um, it's, but it, it's actually, it's the same size and the same animal, but it's not done up with a fancy haircut like that one is. And do I look like that? Yeah, I sort of do, don't I, really? Um, so anyhow, I walk the dog. Um, um, now, one of the things I want to say here is that is a very different kind of walk to that walk. So that's a goal-oriented walk, walk, right, where I'm going to work. Here I'm just walking because the dog needs walking, right? And in fact, the dog's walking me. So there's actually a semantic difference between one walk and another, which gets lost. They're both, you know, in normal grammatical terms, walk is, it's past tense of the word to walk, but in fact, there are, there are grammatical differences between those sentences uh, around case and transitivity and a few things like that. This one here now is, um, I walk the prisoners to their cells. So the prisoners were walking of their, of their own volition, and that's me again, see, in the, the centre? Um, um, so um, uh, they were being walked by me. Now, the important thing is, how does the GPT pick up the differences between those three kinds of walked? Right? And what it does is about the statistical relationships of those words to words around them. So what it we might come up with is not, I, you know, in normal grammar, walk, walked, walking, you know, there are how many, gen how many versions of that? Not many. It might have 20,000 versions of walked. And what it does, it then gives each of those a kind of a, a mix. So when it says billions of parameters, it means because it's turned the basic words of English into billions of versions of things like the word walk. Now, what I want to say is um, what we do with human beings is we know the subtleties between those three different forms of walk. Every day we work with those subtleties and the, the subtleties of them, um, and we understand them intuitively. But it's a kind of grammatical attention which linguists would call a voice transitivity case. These are words which are used to describe those differences. And in our transpositional grammar, the words we use uh, reference and agency, and there are ways of kind of building up kind of a more finely grained semantic analysis of what's going in on in those three sentences. But the machine only pays statistical attention. So that's a very big difference between us as humans. We have this kind of me meta view of the world around different types of agency. There's agency where the, the dog takes me, there's agency where I'm going to work, there's agency where I'm forcing somebody else. So we have this kind of um, sets of grammatical meanings in our lives, which is a semantic system. Often it's not articulated. We can't give it words like voice, transitivity, and case. But um, that's how we operate. That's how we deal with the infinite complexity of the world and how we reduce it to something which is understandable. The system operates purely statistically in a way that no humans ever could. Profoundly different. Um, now, if you want to know more about this, this is a QR code here where you'll find the, all these papers, to be quite frank. This one, um, where we've talked about this distinction in more detail. Okay, that's where we've got to with generative AI. Um, I might, I, I, we, we could stop for questions, but I think I'll keep on going. Raphael, I keep, we keep going, you think? Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, are you exhausted by it? Can you deal with more? Okay, we'll keep going. Because there are two big steps to go yet. So, a case study. What are we doing with our students? So uh, the scholar environment, which you, know, you're, you folks are working in part of it with the, the conference, the event part, and the community part, um, we use it for, as an e-learning environment as well. One to, one to five is what we've used it as historically, but um, we have just um, uh, added a generative AI part of this, and I'm going to show you it at work. Um, what we do also is we data mine all student activity while they're, they're doing stuff. So they're doing all sorts of stuff in this environment. They're 
making posts, they're doing peer reviews of each other's work, and we have an analytics here with a whole lot of different variables where we're data mining all the work that they're doing. So here, um, this was a course with 20 or 30 students. By the end of the eight-week term, um, there were 2,900 pieces of actionable feedback, backwards and forwards between the, the learners, uh, and 860,000 data points. So by working in a digital environment, this is this platform idea, we can data mine activity and we can use the environment to give feedback and to support peer-to-peer -peer human feedback. That's just to give you a bit of a context. Now, I want to talk to you particularly about this workflow that we used for the work I'm about to show you. So I'm going to show you a piece of student work. So we have a thing called a project, and what the student does is they start off by doing a draft. Now, we don't have to do it in this order, but we've decided this order works in an interesting way. When they do their draft, we give them an AI review. So I'm going to show you that AI review in a second. Then after that, they can revise and submit. Then they um, do peer reviews against the same criteria that the AI has used. They can give each other feedback on feedback. Uh, then they can move on to um, write a change note, which is, OK, you know, how useful was the human feedback? How useful was the, 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 um, the machine feedback? Um, and to what extent is this social work that we've been doing, can I credit it to my peers? Can I credit it to the machine? So it's actually up front declaring which bits are mine and which bits, how much I was inf influenced by the social and the machine environment. And then that can be then published, revise and resubmit, and then uh, published to um, a personal portfolio. That's the model. Now, behind this um, is this kind of theory, and the words down the left are kind of just, uh, I want to explain where the prompts come from that, that, that go into the machine. Um, that's a long playing version, but we have this kind of view of knowledge work where you can do some things which are empirical, some things which are conceptual, some things which are analytical, some things which involve application. So we built kind of knowledge activity into a schema like this, and in fact we use a version of this schema with the, the journal peer review as well. Now, I am going to jump out now and show you an example of some student work. So I'm going to jump out of PowerPoint and show you an example. But before I do that, I want to explain something about the architecture. On the left here is um, uh, a read-only version of a student text. This is a real piece of student text, one of our students. And then what happens is the feedback comes back as a series of colored post-it notes. It's actually a lot of stuff. So we've kind of done it in this way. And you can move them around, and you can interact, and you know, uh, whatever. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you, oh, before I do that, I'm going to talk to you about the learning model and then show you an example. So the learning model is on the left is the work, but on the right is feedback and dialogue around the work. OK, so that on the right, it could be machine feedback, it could be peer feedback, it could be instructor feedback. And here, the kind of theoretical model behind it is you've got your multimodal text editor on the left where you're doing work, cognition, individual learning. This is my work. I'm working on this darn thing. And then on the right, what you've got is AI and human feedback, which is formative assessment, metacognition, thinking about the nature of thinking, which is how do I do this kind of work, and collaborative learning, where the, the machine and peers are all collaborators. So I'm going to take you into this work here. So I'm going to jump out of the PowerPoint for a moment. And this was, I'm going to go over into Scholar. So just give me one moment now. And I will pull that down, pull that down. So this is a piece of student work here um, where this particular student, and this was like two weeks ago, a week ago, it's a new piece of work, is talking about community murals as a multimodal experience. So it's working with students to build community murals. So that's just what the thing's about. Um, and you can see here we've got this multimodal editor. Um, so she's put in a picture of uh, John Dewey there and put in some diagrams. And over here on the right, we've got a rubric with review criteria. So that, that were the things you saw in that color model, which is experience, evidence, concepts, theory, reasonable critique, application, innovation, referencing. And then over here, um, if a human does a review, what they can do is they can drag across that slider. And oh, that's because uh, I've been logged out. I'm sorry. Anyhow, look, uh, um, I won't try and go to it. So what, what happens there, it'll take a little while to go back in, and I mightn't get to the same spot. Um, here's another view here. This is the human review, by the way, uh, where on each of these criteria, you can see what the human's written. Um, it's, um, um, 
you know, they've written some nice feedback. This is a human review of this particular piece of work. And look, let me go back to here again. And uh, no, that's the, that version. Um, I'll just show you how much work it is. This is a, like, a, it's a full essay. So here's John Dewey. Here's, um, they've put in videos. This is a video about um, Diego Rivera, who's a great mur muralist. This is murals in Chicago, Community of Social Mural Transformation. I just want to give you the, ex the, the extent of the work. Richard Rorty speaking about John Dewey. Um, so it's a multimodal work. Here's an example of the students doing the, working on the mural. Here are some examples of, there's a table talking about the comparative study. There are some sh Chicago murals that, that the students put in. Um, here are some Instagram-y things. So it's a big piece of work, but I want to go to the end of it just to show you what a big, you know, and then references. This is a standard piece of academic work, and this is like a, a major project the student's done. Um, now, what I want to show you as well while I'm here is the rubric. Now, what you're going to be freaked out about, I think, is just look how verbose that is. That's a really, this is just one criterion, two criteria, three criteria. So what we've done is we've put in these hugely verbose rubrics because the more verbose they are, and you know, um, a rubric is normally tight and, 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 and carefully synoptic. Uh, what works with the GPT is you g give something where you say it one way, say it another way, say it a third way, you're re you know, repetitive and, and uh, you know, in terms of synonyms for things and, and whatever. So you explain each of these things. What's, what's critique? Okay, well, the, the GPT needs to know. What's application? So this is a whole lot of stuff. Now, we give the students the same verbose prompt that we're giving to the, the GPT. Um, now, what I want to show you now is I'm going to give you um, a text dump of, um, the, of the response. Now, you saw the student responses before in the peer review. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to give you, let you go through. I'm going to show you this response. And my question to you is, uh, if you're a teacher marking this assignment, how much feedback, how long would it take you to read it and how much comment, how many comments would you make? Just give yourself a mental answer. You've got this piece of work about murals, lovely piece of work, you're going to give the student feedback. Feedback because they're going to rewrite it. The feedback's not just at the end, it's, it's formative, not summative. Okay, here we go. Response. The essay how da, 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 presents a thorough explanation of the section of the public and how computer murals or whatever. The author's background as an art educator and practitioner in Chicago is effectively utilized to frame. Um, while the author offers insights and motivation, there is a missed opportunity to delve deeper into specific... Now, what we've done is we've told the... G See these XP, EXP experience minus, experience plus? We've told the GPT, give critical comments. It will be really nice to you unless you ask it to give you critical comments and constructive comments. Relevance and importance. Uh, now, by the way, I hope you're all good at speed reading. I'm going to go through the whole list. I don't want you to miss anything, okay? In terms of relevance, the essay, da, 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 da. the essay was awarded a rating of four, justifying the rating. The author's interest and motivation is well explained. The essay effectively is an example, pretty good. Uh, excels in theoretical ground and provision of examples of a mural project. Lacks, lacks detailed empirical data on the outcomes of these projects. Wow, what's that as a comment? Suggestions for improvement, inclusion of empirical studies, da 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 da. I hope you're reading this, you're not missing any of the, the detail. The rating is given because da 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 response, the essay was, and oh, by the way, I'm up to two out of four criteria. Um, definition of concepts, this is thinking about how it, w it works theoretically. The conclusion, um, uh, the theory criterion, again, more on theory, addressing theory. Uh, you, how are you going there reading this? Um, am I going too fast for you? You want me to slow down a bit? Important, the essay effectively, uh, da 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 da. Um, response, now, I want to tell you, I'm going to tell you in a second how, it, how we managed to do this, because you can't do this normally just by using GPT in the raw. The essay, the essay does not sufficiently explore alternative competing and conflicting theories. Wow. You better do that. Um, suggested of improvement, to be more effective, the writer should consider it. A deeper analysis of the critique of da-da-da-da-da, discussion of whatever, da-da-da-da. Okay, how are you going now with this? Am I going too fast for you? Will I slow down a bit? Practical examples, suggestions for improvement, conclusion. Now we're up to 4B, criterion 4B, which is innovation. Um, the essay excels in innovative thinking. Um, the proposal integrate IA tools like Canva or Bing Designer in the mural design pro process showcases forward thinking approach to education. Good on you, that's great. But while it provides a comprehensive, and I'm going to go on. Sorry, I'm, I, I should have read it all to you, but I've decided I'll just skip through it. Now, you know, what's really, look, 
Look, there we go. So look, what, what's really interesting about this is that there's detail in that which no human instructor could feasibly give. Now, how did we manage to pull that off? And I'm going to jump back now to the PowerPoint, um, uh, which is here. Uh, where was it? Sorry. I'm going to look at it straight on. Oh, maybe I'll just pull this out of the way. Here we go. So this was just a... Okay, so we've seen that. We've seen that. Right, so firstly, what we've do, done with this Scholar um, AI environment is firstly, we're LLM agnostic. So one of the things is we can connect this thing in. We, we happen to connect what you just saw into GPT-4, but we can actually connect into Gemini and other LLMs as well. And what's really interesting, by the way, is the emergence of open source lightweight uh, LLMs. Uh, which work really, really well. The open source lightweight ones work really, really well if you do something called fine tuning, which I'm going to show you now. So we might be liberated from Google and um, OpenAI, which is in fact really Microsoft now, um, if, if we watch how those develop. But what we do is we have what's called a vector knowledge base. So you know the connection between walk and dog? Uh, that's a vector, right? And there are billions of them in these darn things. So what we do is we have this um, system, we're using a technology called retrieval augmented generation. So what we did is we put in every word that all our students, our graduate students, have written in Scholar for the last five years, and everything that Mary and I have written on this and other related topics. So our students work around educational technology and learning and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, the, our vector database has 35 million words in it. Nothing, just upload 35 million words. And what it's done is it's mashed them all up and built the relationships between all those words um, uh, around those, those vectors. Um, but what we do is prompt engineering. Me typing in the history of the Peloponnesian Railway is pretty trivial. What we do in the prompt is we put the whole of that verbose rubric and the whole of the work in 10 times, right? So what we've got is the verbose prompt plus the whole work. And you saw the size of the work, it's big. Um, so now the context windows in these are really, really big. They weren't that until quite recently. Um, and it analyzes those. So it goes past that work 10 times. And they were the 10 colored post-it notes you saw coming up. Um, so what we're working on now is we're working on multi-agent programming. So it's possible to have these things called agents, which look at, look at it from different perspectives. Multimodal, what we're about to do is be able to analyze the content of those videos as well um, that, have been, that, that the student embedded. Um, dialogical, which is the student should be able to say, well, what did you mean by that? So we're working on putting that in so you can ask for clarification. You know, um, you know when it said, oh, you didn't do enough critical theory, the student might say, well, look, tell me what to do. Um, and finally, to dial up um, uh, the, dial the feedback up and down. That's too much feedback, actually. Um, maybe it's not. So you should be able to say, look, give me less feedback, give me more feedback, depending on, um, and that's something which is eminently doable. There's a paper there which is now kind of a bit out of date, where we, which we published in archive um, about um, the, this work two or three stages back. What I'm showing you now is literally work that's been done in the last several weeks. Um, so this is what we need to do. This is how we can make it work. It doesn't, it's not great, it's not a great thing at all in terms of just the open interfaces that you have there uh, with Gemini or OpenAI. Um, but nevertheless, these are things that we can do. And by the way, that's the, that's the paper that, back there. That's the, um, the archive paper. OK. Now, 12.09. We've, I've, uh, we've got till 25, yes? Yeah, OK. Well, I'll be quick. This is why artificial intelligence is a terrible idea. Are you ready for this? Um, so, um, and what we want to, we want to replace what's happening here with another, another term, which I'm going to talk to you about. So firstly, artificial general intelligence, which is, here's OpenAI promoting the idea. There's all sorts of conspiracy theories about Q star, which you might have seen, um, which is, you know, no one knows quite what happened with Sam Altman in that damn fracas last year, but there's a huge Elon Musk case now where they're alleging they've got this secret Q star thing down the back, which is interestingly pretty close to QAnon, by the way, in terms of conspiracy theories. Um, my argument is that this is impossible. What's general intelligence, by the way? General intelligence is the same thing that um, IQ tests always measured. So you know G is the result of an IQ test. So G is I'm 100, which is I'm in the middle. 140, I'm brilliant. And 70, I'm stupid. Um, so um, uh, the, that's what they're talking about. 
G, it's the same G of, general, of, of, of IQ tests. Now, argue, our argument is that it's impossible. That, that it's a different technology doing something different. And some of our papers, we go into this in more detail. So who invented this damn phrase? Well, this man's John McCarthy, um, who invented the phrase. And interestingly, he did it just as a, a catch thing to get funding. So in 1955, he put in an um, application to get funding to run a seminar, which happened at Dartmouth. Dartmouth and he's the one who invented the idea. Now, in terms of the very idea, the very idea is that the machine can be intelligent like a human can. And our very idea is, no, it can't. The machine can be much, much smarter than a human being in a, in a, in a statistical sense. Um, like, it can know every published word. Well, I can't know that. And it can know the statistical relationship between every published word and every other published word. I can't know that. But what it can't know is the grammatical difference between walk and walk and walk. It can't know that. Um, so what happens, our argument is the idea that um, this human intelligence can be replicated in a machine is a completely naive, improper idea. These are totally different forms of uh, intelligence. And artificial intelligence, the idea, leads us down a, a, um, a dead end. Now what we want to do is we want to replace it with this idea, um, cyber. So um, people may know that the, the person who invented this notion was Norbert uh, Weiner in um, his book uh, 47 or so. Um, um, and for him, this is the, the origins of cyber. So this is a Greek pot. And the, cyber, the Kubernetes was this man here, or this person here, with the ore. So what you do with an ore is you have a system where the human is in tune with the and adjusting one way, adjusting, in order to go straight, you keep adjusting one way and adjusting the other. So it's about feedback systems. It's not about replicating anything. It's about the relationship between the machine and nature and the human being being a feedback relationship. So that's what the cyber idea is in terms of its origin. And Mary and I have written a kind of a history of the origin of this cyber idea here. Um, and again, there'll be a QR code again where you can get all of these. A fantastically interesting um, story about the, the origins of this notion of cybernetics. Now, so what we want to do is we want to pr propose something where we talk about the relationship of people and machines, and here I'm talking to people at both conferences, the technology conference as well as the e-learning one. Um, this is the first cybernetic machine. Uh, and I love this machine. <laughs> we saw this machine at the, go, when you go to the Science Museum, when you go to London, go to the Science Museum, and this machine's there, and nobody's looking at it, and they should be, and they should be looking at this little red thing over here on the left. That little red thing that I've circled, and that's a thing called a governor. I love this word, the governor. It's really, really interesting, because it's a machine that governs itself. Now, let me tell you what those two little balls do. They're kind of like this, and there's a weight at the end, right? And they're spinning like this all the time. And when, so this is, of course, uh, Bolton and Watts um, steam engine of 1784, which was built to pump water out of the mines in, in Cornwall, actually. So um, what's happening is that uh, that's what, it's a steam engine with this big arm and a pump. Okay, what's the governor do? It's this little thing here where the balls are spinning, and if there's, see if I can get this around the right way, if there's too much steam coming in, they spin out, and it reduces the steam input to the machine. If there's not enough steam, they spin down, and more, uh, more steam goes into the machine. So it's a way of regulating the machine. Now, you could have an operator there uh, regulating the machine, but this is, a mach this is a machine which, in this little thing called the governor, regulates itself. That's a really interesting, that's a huge kind of, um, in, the, in the history of technology, that's a huge shift, a machine which, in some small way, is self-regulating. See, remember, reinforcement learning, the, these things train themselves. This is a learning machine. This is a machine that, that is learning about the amount of steam coming in and adjusts by its own self-learning. Um, and this is called a servo mechanism. So the idea is that in a non-trivial machine, so a trivial machine is I've got a shovel, I dig a hole, and there's a reaction, right? A non-trivial machine also has ways in which the machine can relate to itself around a governor. Right? So, in a way, we're dealing with something which is not modern. It's, you know, 1784, yeah, it's modern in that sense, um, but these machines are extended versions of that. So, I'm putting this here to try and elaborate technically what we mean by cyber, any machine which is to some degree self-governing. Now, so what we want to do is we want to talk about cyber social learning as opposed to artificial intelligence as a relationship between a machine and a person, and a feedback system between two fundamentally different forms of uh, intelligence, if you like, if you want to use that word even. 
So, um, uh, and what we want to say as well is that why would you even try and replicate this? Because firstly, the analogy of the brain, brain analogy you used all the time, neural networks is one terrible example of it, which is nothing like a brain. Uh, neural networks um, are a statistical method, uh, which is nothing like the way the brain works. And the brain is more than binary. All these neural networks can do, or all computers can do, ultimately is work with binary notation. But also bodies are more than brains. I mean, we can feel things, we can sense things, um, and our meanings are in these other f modes. Don't forget, generative AI reduces everything to text, right? <laughs> uh, and behind text is Unicode, and behind Unicode is binary notation. It's a set of reductions which don't have feelings or emotions or bodies or senses, and a lot of our lives are dependent on that. But also contexts are more than bodies. Um, you know, there's this something about this room, there's something about these familiar objects where the meaning is in our material world around us as well. And computers can pick up none of that or pick it up poorly. So the, these things are two, um, are two very, very different things. And for us, the answer is how do you build an analysis of complementarity um, as opposed to um, uh, an analysis where the machine replicates the human? Okay, that's it. And that's it. That, that um, QR code will take you to the papers that I've just shown you. I've got this one still. You, you take the one. Oh. oh. Interesting, very interesting talk. And now it's time for discussion or questions. Any, any comment or anything from? Yeah, somebody would like to ask a question. Yeah. Is it working? Uh, thank you for that talk. That was great. Uh, the historical um, aspect view is, is fantastic. One of the things that I find so troubling about this uh, is that, you know, you mentioned the Gutenberg Press. I would say that uh, part of what has made generative AI so difficult is that we're moving at a speed where we've gone from the Gutenberg Press to <laughs> word processors to fax machines to yep. I don't know what. Um, to the internet in, in a matter of literally months, right? And it's, it's continuing to chug along, right? So now we can yeah. generate videos, we can do images that are actually quite good. Um, the text keeps getting better. Um, adjusting is, you know, in, at universities we're fairly lo slow to adjust. Right. And uh, I've heard a lot of talk both here and back at home at the university that, um, you know, that there are small adjustments that you can make in how you deal with this. Um, and sort of like we can keep doing the same thing, let's just do these small little modifications. And I don't think that's going to no, work for it's not very work. long. Um, could you address how the rate of change is very different from this than anything else that we've seen before? Yeah, it, it's, it's incredibly fast. So. Part of my message was it's also been a bit slow in that we've had chatbots since 66 and the statistical language processing for a long time. So, um, so part of it, it's kind of been on the horizon and the platform bit of it has been on the horizon for a long time as well. So, um, but actually it's one, uh, one, one key article which breaks the back of making this really accessible. And interestingly, it was a Google group that wrote this article in 2017 called Attention is All That's counts or attention is all that matters. People probably know the article. So the people at Google Brain developed the statistical technique of, so every word in the world, world times every word is not within the bounds of any um, computer, no matter how fast it is, but they developed a, a ra way of rationalising the reinforcement learning, a 2017 article uh, which is published in archive. Um, by Vasami et al. So that was really the, the breakthrough, and since then it's just gone at lightning speed. You're absolutely right. Um, uh, and look, 
no one's going to be immune from it. These are massive, massive changes. And um, as I say, I'm not a techno enthusiast and I've been doing this for a long, long time and I'm just surprised by how quickly it's happened. Um, so what it does, it puts um, a lot of teaching out of work, to be quite frank, because you saw the the kind of responses that it's feasible for a human to give. Um, you, know, um, uh, you know, this can be much better than a human in a whole lot of ways, but very different from a human, of course. That's part of our argument. So it changes the role of teachers. Um, but if you go right across the knowledge economy, what's going to happen to accountants? What's going to happen to lawyers? What's going to happen to um, uh, architects? Um, uh, in, so there's, you know, if you, a big picture view of this is that the Industrial Revolution um, pulled a lot of people out of farms, mechanising farming, and now very few people work on farms. Automation pulled a lot of people out of manufacturing, now very few people work there. And the last very labour-intensive market was the knowledge economy, which we in education are primarily geared to. Um, and this is uh, going to have huge effects on the knowledge economy. So th th there's both... It's both... Um, it's potentially disastrous, and given the fact that rich people dominate the, the underlying technology. Um, it could be another situation of exacerbating inequality or it could be liberatory. So the only thing is that this is a huge moment and we have to think about what to do. And you know, in universities, you can't get around the fact that you cannot know, what, except for my model there of putting the kids in the classroom and putting their blinkers on and not allowing them connected to a computer and whatever. You can't know um, what works done by a student and what works done by a machine. What we've done in our environment is we've tried to have the machine there and have it explicit and have the students declare, oh, I've really got this useful idea from there. So in other words, the cybernetic relationship is what we then have to put into pedagogy. There's no avoiding this damn stuff, but build the cybernetic relationship into, uh, into or cyber social relationship into learning. So that's our kind of solution. But you're right, um, I don't think most people haven't realised the significance of this, I think, yet. Uh, but it's it's hitting very fast. Thank you. Time for one more short question. All right. So, quick comment. Uh, general intelligence may be beyond our reach because the metaphor for the brain is not a binary computer. Exactly. It's probably a quantum computer. Exactly. Uh, but my question is this. Why are we trying to, to build a, a machine that is as intelligent as a human when maybe we should be looking at how can we augment the capability that you, humans already have exactly. to, to think? So uh, we were talking about a different section and, and in a different section and we were talking about what if Einstein had the help from, from technologies like this, right? So his ability of think, uh, thought, uh, experiments would be incredibly much more effective, right? And where would we be if, if, if scientists like that had the help of, of technology, right? Yeah, and I think one of the big things is methodological about research methods. Um, I've read an article just recently about the effectiveness um, of doing regression analysis, statistical analysis in these environments, but obviously qualitative methodologies as well. So there's a whole lot, it'll change the, uh, the work of researchers as well. But, but before the session ends, by the way, what I might mention is that we're doing a special, or oh, actually my colleagues, Gabrielle Zapeta and John Jones, uh, Gabrielle's at the University of Nottingham and John Jones is at SUNY Cortland, are doing a special issue for this journal on generative AI. So if anybody would like We've got papers around this generative AI stuff. We're looking for papers for this special issue of the, uh, the Research Networks Journal. So if, if anybody's working in this area and they'd like to contribute, we're looking for contributions. There was one quick question or comment over there. So I have a sense with a lot of this that it's a lot of this generative AI stuff is making us look at, it's making us actually have to do things that we've talked about doing for a long time. Like, we've been talking about, um, we need to teach students to be critical readers and to evaluate what they're reading and evaluate the plausibility of sources. We need to um, deal with uh, essay mills and students cheating on exams and all of these things. Um, is there, you know, is there some potential upside to finally having to actually solve these problems that we've just sort of been telling ourselves we had to solve? Is there, is there some way we could be doing 
doing what we do better um, under the impetus of, of having to give up on doing it the old way. Yeah, yeah, I, I do think it's it's disruptive, and what we've got to do is turn the disruptions into something positive in exactly the ways you're saying, to be quite frank, um, which is, um, yeah, critically evaluating, the t and critically evaluate what the, the GPTs generate as well. So I think, yeah, the, it, it's going to make all of that stuff essential. So, yes, I agree. There's one more question over here. We've got a... so much for the information you've shared. Um, at our university, we have decided to, um, University of Tennessee um, at Martin, we decided to tell our professors or encourage our professors to get um, behind, so to speak, maybe not behind is the right word, but get behind chat GPT usage of our students by just having them more, have the instructors more concerned about what was their reasoning for using ChatGPT? What was their thought process in wanting to go to ChatGPT? Having them uh, talk about their thought process, which is what in higher ed we should be encouraging our students to do anyway. So what ideas or suggestions would you give us as university professors to further engage our students in the learning process, which is what they're supposed right. to be doing, um, versus just going to chat GPT for suggestions or right. ideas. Yep. So look, I'll give a technical answer to that, by the way. Remember I said there were two sides to this. There's the chat side and the LLM side. Un uh, just as they are, without recalibration, they're, they're really problematic in the ways that I just um, uh, um, highlighted. On the chat side, um, it's technically called prompt engineering, which is how you optimise the prompts into the machine and multiple prompts. So if the students just say, you know, help me do this, it's it kind of, you won't get great answers, but there are ways to optimise the value in terms of what would traditionally be regarded as assessment rubrics. And there are particular ways to deal with those rubrics, like you know, these verbose prompts and multiple passes against different criteria. So that's one of the things we've done. So you've, you know, our argument is you've got to recalibrate the underlying stuff. On the chat side, you recalibrate the underlying stuff with prompt engineering. On the uh, LLM side, you recalibrate it with this retrieval augmented generation, which is you put in text which talk about what you want to do. So let's say you're doing cell biology. Um, well, what you need to do is put in 10 cell biology textbooks. Um, so in other words, and then, the, uh, then it prioritises that knowledge base uh, um, in the work. But the, the, so the answer is what we've got to do in education is we've got to build a layer above those technologies which calibrates um, the, uh, uh, the, the experience for the learner to the domain at the LLM end and then to the assessment rubric at the chat side of things. So that's what we've been working on. Um, and then, you know, you've got something which is really useful, but what I call, you know, using them in the wild, which is going to the, uh, the, the, the GPT interface is, um, uh, it's got a lot of problems with it, and, but the question is how we, you know, uh, recalibrate to make it optimally useful. And then I think it is, you saw this, I think it is pretty useful. So, any more questions? One more. Yeah, then we'll stop here. Hi, thank you for your talk. I really um, appreciate your suggestion of, of of recontextualizing um, artificial intelligence as a cyber, with, with all the implications of that. Um, I was really struck by your use of the word prompt engineering. It's a, it's a powerful pragma, and, we, I, and you're using it in a very specific way, in a very specific context, which is what we need to do with, with this stuff. Um, do you have any thoughts on, like, if we take prompt engineering as a really good metaphor for an, a kind of interaction, how do we prompt engineer our economic system? <laughs> okay, let's go and have lunch now. <laughs> let's go to the next session. Um, that's, for, that's for the next conference, by the way. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, actually, look, the really interesting thing is... Um, is what would be possible in a society which uh, equitably distributes 
equitably distributed resources based on the rational um, uh, allocation of labour and then allocation of resources. And look, it's another whole paper. In the cybernetics paper, we talk about it. Um, there was a very interesting moment at the very end of the Soviet Union be, where they had a planned economy, where they were thinking of building a cybernetic um, economic planning system, which was not a market system. That's another whole incredibly interesting story. And by the way, the uh, IND in Chile tried that, a thing called CyberSyn at the very end of the, of the IND regime before they were toppled. Um, they were building a thing called cyber, which was a social resource allocation system based on cybernetic principles. So that's for the next conference. And for, uh, that's for after the revolution. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Great, thank you for sharing it. Thank you. Thank you.